great pleasure to announce my friend and colleague from Global, Dr. Ayanna Bowellen. She's currently a UC President's postdoc here at Berkeley. Uh, Dr. Bowellen got her PhD from the University of Texas Austin in Anthropology, a Master's in African and African American Studies. Her research uh, interests are shaped and um, focused on historical archaeology, community-based archaeology, uh, processes of identity formation, representations of slavery, and black feminist theory. In the fall, she'll be joining uh, the Anthropology Department at the City University of New York Queens College as an assistant professor. Yeah. <laughs> Ayana is the co-founder of the Society of Black Archaeologists, which was created in 2011. The SBA is dedicated to lobbying on behalf of African diaspora sites around the world, increasing the presence of black people in archaeology and involving black communities in the conservation of their own heritage. Just recently, the SBA was granted its uh, 501c3 status as an organization, and Dr. Glowellen helped start that foundation when she was an undergrad. <laughs> the bulk of her research bans that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't think about what I was doing when I was an undergrad. <laughs> the bulk of her research spans the uh, archaeology of the African diaspora. For the last few years, she's been working in St. Croix in the Caribbean on a project with several other folks. Um, uh, focused at the Estate of Princess, which is a former gain of sugar plantation. Uh, her recent uh, publications uh, involve uh, 2017 art art article on historical archaeology locating marginalized historical narratives at Kingsley Plantation, where she explores some of the ways the narratives at that, um, at that park represent African American people, uh, specifically black women. She proposes that by representing the plantation from the perspective of enslaved black folks would help insert marginal, these marginalized people into the present, making them more relevant to today's visitors. 2018, she co-published an article on Transforming Anthropology, Assessing Heritage Resources in St. Croix, uh, Post-Hurricane Irma and Maria, which discusses the response that SBA and several other folks had there on the island with regard to assessing damage to archaeological sites and helping provide humanitarian aid. Her current book that's coming out is focused on some of the things that we're going to hear about today, so I won't really steal her thunder, but um, uh, it's my pleasure. I'm honored to introduce my friend, Ayanna Kowala. Research found that gendered adornment practices among 
tenant farmers and rural Texas are dialectical negotiations between socialized racial and gender component trends as well as individual satellite choice choices. While my current research is not included in the book project, my hope is that the book will provide a platform for my theoretical and methodological engagement with archaeological work at the state local princess, located in the island of St. Croix, where I'm focusing on the lived experiences of enslaved and later free ethnic regions, exploring quotidian practices of self-making from enslavement and emancipation through the lens of drugs. So in terms of shifting the dissertation, and I always say the dissertation because it always feels so um, <laughs> into a book project, I'm particularly interested in deepening my engagement with black feminist theory. In rereading the dissertation, I became aware that I've seen racism, sexism, classism a number of times throughout the text without really diving deeper into the intricacies of processes of racialization, exploitive capitalism that led to the foundation of wage and sharecropping and disengagement with the southern farming economy, and practices of sexual exploitation while still facing the field as agricultural workers and within the homes of white families that have been Additionally, I'll be spending a month in Charlottesville this year working with the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, combing back through my data sets to find entry ways of quantitative analyses that really allow the material culture itself to shine within the project. With that being said, I'm having a bit of difficulty balancing the combination of quantitative um, analysis methods and the value of qualitative analysis um, provided from documentary sources such as photographs and narratives. I received critiques um, that my work could oftentimes be too theoretically driven, but um, with the material focus, if not enough material focus, and the artifacts themselves getting lost in theoretical drama, so to say. But I really want to posit that black feminist archaeology and other intersectional, positional based theoretical approaches can in fact be theoretically, methodologically, and analytically robust. Um, finally, I'm also interested in discussing the use of photographs and narratives within the book project. Um, I was actually saying in front of you, but um, to my right, I actually have a number of different photographs. And if you want, please feel free to keep to the side of Because they're in archival blogs. So you can actually take a look at them as they rest with some of the documentary evidence that I used throughout my research. Now, discussing my work at the Levi Jordan Plantation in more detail, starting with a brief historical background of the site, which, led, which will lead into a discussion regarding my research and analysis, and end with a discussion of my results. So. The Levi Jordan Plantation is located in Brazoria County, Texas, which is located about 16 miles south of Houston, Texas, between Metabora County and Galveston County, along the Gulf Coast. By 1848, when Levi Jordan arrived in Brazoria County to establish a sugar plantation in the area, sugar had already um, been a strong, had already strongly been established, um, as well as cotton production. Although Texas became part of the United States in 1845, agricultural production arrived in the area since the early 1820s. This is in large part due to the Brazos River, which kept farmlands rich in nutrients. However, the town's location along the Gulf Coast proved to be detrimental to the sugar industry by the mid 20th century due to deadly hurricanes that stirred up in the Gulf. Its, located, its location did provide easy access to Atlantic waterways for the transportation of goods and people. She and Kelly often discussed the illegal smuggling of enslaved Africans into Brazilian County, which was feasible in large part due to Brazilian's location on the Gulf. However, Highly called Galveston Ellis Island of Texas because of the number of European immigrants that came to the United States who brought the first to Texas in the late 19th, um, throughout the 20th century. Brazoria County, as a port county, provided shops and region, which provided shops and regions access to a wide variety of goods for purchase by county residents, um, as well as you know, those both black and white, during the anti and post bell era. Brown's um, work. Archival research revealed that African Americans who lived at the Levi Jordan plantation brought goods from the Jordan store as well as a number of other shops in the Brazoria County with cash and store card. So, just providing a, a background of how this space functioned um, and gave market accessibility to African Americans. 
So archaeological research at the Levi Jordan Plantation encompasses over three decades of work, the number of people and organizations, most notably is the work conducted by Kenneth Brown, an associate professor at the University of Houston, who excavated the site from 1986 to 2006. Since 2002, the site has been staying open with plans under the direction of the Texas Historical Commission to transform the plantation into a premier public heritage site for the interpretation of slavery in Texas. During the tenure of Brown's work, he located a number of structures at the site. The image on the slide outlines these structures predominantly in red. The main house, barn, detached kitchen, and to the south of the plantation, four cabin blocks were discovered that housed the enslaved and native tenant farmers who lived and labored at the site. So three of the four cabin blocks house six individual cabins aligned in two columns, while one block house eight individual cabins aligned in two blocks. A total of 19 cabins had at least one excavation unit placed in them. However, for the purposes of my research, I examined artifacts from the seven most extensively excavated cabins at the site. So these are cabins from block one and two. So my research builds atop the work of Brown and his students, asking in what ways can a black feminist framework expand interpretations of clothing and adornment at the site. My research project asks how did race, gender, and class operations of power and oppression shape African American women's identity during the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Texas. This project addresses this question using archaeological and documentary evidence by investigating why African American women engaged in particular practices of dress and adornment in Texas from 1865 to 1910. And under the umbrella of my larger question, I ask, in what ways were sartorial practices embedded in relation with ideologies of race, gender, and class? And how did black women negotiate these operations of power and oppression and dress? Additionally, I ask, given the relationship between fashion and the construction of hegemonic notions of femininity, are black women's clothing and adornment practices representative of resistance and or conformity to these notions? Is there evidence of a formation of a distinctive black womenhood? And finally, as African American women move throughout various spaces, at home, at work, and in public spaces, during a time of heightened racial oppression, how were their choices regarding dress influence? How were their choices of dress and adornment situation to the spaces they occupied? So I opened the section of the presentation with a quote from Maria um, Snyder, an ex enslaved woman who labored and lived in Texas. In a circa 1895 stereoscope of African American men, women, and children, picking cotton in New York. Snyder says, We wore law clothing, and I never see no other kind of dress till after surrender. Surrender, as Maria called the emancipation of roughly 4 million African Americans in 1865, marked the start of the Reconstruction era, which brought with it new challenges and opportunities. In Snyder's work of workers administration, in his view, she notes clear differences in sartorial practices from antebellum and post-Burn eras. Wall clothing, as not as Snyder stated, were made of coarse cotton cloth that the enslaved were provided by plantation owners and were often produced on site by the by enslaved seamstresses. These pieces of cloth were plainly designed with decoration and stylization coming from those enslaved who, throughout many WPA narratives, recounted the myriad of ways they dyed their clothing with, quote, sumac berries or sweet gum bark to align with personal aesthetics. The antebellum era brought with it the rise of mass consumer culture and different avenues of market accessibility that contributed to opportunities for newly emancipated African Americans to engage in different sartorial practices within the bounds of economic and geographic access while they navigated racial and gender segregation. Within the captured sacred tones of the of the scary of the stereoscope are complexities of racial, gender, class, and age realities experienced by African American farmers in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Women are dressed in gowns fastened with hook and eye buttons, along with gingham blouses that match their pattern hand scarves. These were coupled with coarse cotton petticoats fashioned with light colored aprons. Dried cotton bristles put print at the flesh of these laborers as they picked bowls of cotton that were placed into the bottoms of sacks that were slung over their shoulders. This labor was not gendered. Everyone labored in what seemed like endless fields of white cotton or green sugarcane stalks and coffee plates. Men were dressed in dark, um, dark trousers which were held up by tin and copper alloy and buckles as well as suspended fasteners. Trousers were coupled with white colored shirts which were then accompanied with black soft slouch hats. This labor also knew no age limit. It was learned by the young as soon as they were able to participate. 
Thus, the socialization of labor and dress passed from adults to children, as evidenced by the young girl in this, in this photo, dressed in her own gingham gown and patterned headscarf that matched the clothing of adult women in cotton nearby. The young girl stands next to a nearly full wicker basket that reached out to her waist, adding what she could to the collection. This image depicts what I believe are formations of black womanhood. I define black womanhood as a constructed identity that moves fluidly over regions and shifts over time, that acknowledges the particularities of African American women's subjectivities, and that, like other identity formations, is constructed in alignment and disjunction with hegemonic ideologies. I theoretically ground my term, I theoretically ground my use of the term black womanhood within the work of Toni Morrison, who theorizes black women as contradiction itself, and with the nod to Patricia Hill Collins, who theorizes black women as outsiders within. Both of these frameworks conceptualize black women in their production of identity as simultaneously being in alignment with, in this juncture, two hegemonic notions of womanhood reserved for white, middle, and upper class white women. Using these frameworks, I created an avenue to discuss African American women's construction of black womanhood as a process of self making that re inscribes and debunks ideologies of the body that speak to and push against histories of oppression that position black women outside the realm of hegemonic community. This process of re inscribing and debunking relies on Avery Gordon's conceptualization of the power sets to be black women's bodies. With Gordon's theorization in mind, I conceptualize black women's undressed bodies as already having a history onto them that is spread through the color of their flesh and the texture of their hair as outside the realms of hegemonic femininity and womanhood. This pattern has operated in the past and continues to shape present formations of black women's identity in the present. Doing this work required applying an analytical framework that centered the intersecting operations of race, gender, and class that structured the lives of black women in the past. The theoretical framework that guides this research is Kimberl Crenshaw's theorization of intersectionality, which locates the positionality of black women at the intersections of race, gender, and class, operation of power and oppression. Intersectionality is the crux of black feminist theory, as Patricia Hill Collins writes. This theoretical framework works to treat, quote, race, class, gender, and sexuality less as personal attributes and more as systems of domination in which individuals construct unique identities. His theoretical approach aims to engender. His theoretical approach aims to engender examinations of African American history that, at all times, accounts for multiple facets of identity and the ways in which they come to shape so past social lives. Black feminist theory within archaeological research is fairly new, less than 20 years old. It's the centering of intersectionality that differentiates black feminism historically from that of mainstream feminist scholarship and discipline. It's the latter that sets the foundation for most gender analysis within archaeological research. Although intersectionality has not made substantial inroads within historical archaeology, where it's, clean, where it's seen most clearly is in the work of black feminist scholarship. A small group of archaeologists, primarily black women, began asking how the application of black feminist thought could aid in the interpretation of African American past lived experiences in ways that did not compartmentalize multiple facets of black women's experiences, but rather interpreted them as wholly complex. This call for black feminist archaeology was necessarily a call for intersectional analysis. In addition to grounding my research in black feminist theory, I also pull heavily from scholars that have aided in the development of feminist archaeology and archaeological studies that critically analyze um, race and racism. And on the board, I have a couple of the books that I draw from. So we have um, Kimberl Crenshaw on intersectionality. Black Feminist Anthropology, edited by Ronald McLaren. Um, Black Feminist Archaeology, by Steve Battle Baptiste. The Archaeology of Mothering, written by Corey Wilson. And then Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist So I opened this, um, open this presentation asking how processes of racialization and sexual exploitation, along with economic disenfranchisement, converge and diverge to shape territorial practices of self-making among African American women in the late 19th and 20th centuries. I argue that quotidian dress practices, um, sartorial practices of self-making, act as integral formations of black women in post emancipation It's through the repetition of daily practices that identities are formed and reshaped and dressing one's body for the day is one such example of a, of a repetition of a daily practice. It is the buttons, buckles, hook and eyes, along with hair combs and jewelry, which are adjusted into the ways tenant farmers, sharecroppers, and wage laborers who lived and worked at the Levi Jordan plantation during the post-down era and engaged in sartorial practices. 
With an historical archaeological scholarship on identity, the multivariate meanings behind artifacts recovered in archaeological records that relate to dress practices and tools for identity formation. Identity analysis within the field of archaeology provides the foundation of adornment studies, paving an avenue for historical archaeologists to interpret past formations of identities by critically examining what we some would call small things. Beads, buttons, ribbons, suspenders, bodices, hairpins, and hook and eyes are some of the small things that along with documentary evidence serve as the evidence of what Blue Scale would call iterative practices that make up sartorial practices of some making engagement by individuals. Um, building off the work of Eschner and Rosh Higgins, I define sartorial practices as social, as social cultural practices shaped by many intersecting operations of power and oppression, including racism, sexism, and classism, and involved modifications of the corporal form, and all three dimensional supplements added onto the body. The emphasis, the emphasis on intersecting operations of power and oppression, including those that I mentioned before, draws specifically from the work of Black Feminist Theory, which grounds my research question. Through an examination of material culture remains at the Levi Jordan Plantation archival documentation, this project tells the story of how quotidian dress practices shaped and were shaped by past women's experiences of African American women during a period of social reform that really impressed them. For this project, I examined 2,758 artifacts related to clothing and adornment, as well as hygiene and grooming from the seven times I mentioned before at the Levi Jordan Plantation. Were 2,232 buttons, um, 392. Let's go back to that. 392 artifacts classified as jewelry, a classification that comprised of wire, pendant, earrings, chains, watches, and brooch fragments. Um, additionally, I examined 63 hair comb fragments and 11 book and eye facsimiles. Within this project, material culture data was placed in conversation with both documentary and oral historical data. <coughs> Census records, the Levi Jordan post-mellum post um, archival papers, and historic photographs like the ones I passed around. Along with the oral history collection from Cheryl White and Maria Franklin that provide additional historical context that provide further illustration of the living experiences of African Americans during the early 19th and 20th centuries. My examination of the historical data along with documentary and oral history data revealed that black women's historic, that black women's sartorial practices are an avenue of self-making that were shaped by race, gender, and class operations of power and oppression in complex ways. Focusing on everyday modalities of being as spacious where constructions of black women were formed, my interpretation sought to answer my initial research question asking how race, gender, class, and age shaped black women's quotidian dress practices. I focused specifically on the ways sartorial practices were shaped by the nature of domination, within spheres of labor, as well as due to the threat of racial and sexual violence, desires for self representation, and processes of social reproduction. So, just returning to my um, first, um, first and second sub question, I initially asked. You know, given the relationship between fashion and the construction of hegemonic notions of femininity, are black women's clothing and adornment practices representative of resistance and our conformity to these notions? Is there evidence of a distinctive black womanhood? Throughout this project, I argued that constructions of black womanhood were embedded in relations and ideologies of race, gender, and class. Further, black women as historical agents negotiated these operations of power and oppression through dress within the context of labor, violence, social reproduction, and just as significantly, desire and creativity. Given the relationship between fashion and hegemonic notions of femininity, my interpretation suggested that women's clothing and adornment practices are representative of a complex entanglement of resistance and conformity to these notions. The clothing African American women wore while doing agricultural labor was tied to negotiations with femininity. The realities of racial, gender, and class subjection, and the necessity for functional clothing needed for rural southern and agricultural labor. Although African American women tended to land, cooked over hearths, sold, and mended, and washed clothing, gender ideologies about women's appropriate dress were so influential that black women adhered to it, even though their clothing was often impractical for the kinds of labor that they had to do. The clothing African American women wore was incredibly restricted for the kinds of labor they had to perform. 
Within this project, I attempted to move away from binary notions of resistance versus conformity by acknowledging that African American women and their constructions of identity occupy a space of contradiction. Because black women are outsiders within, they dress themselves and their lives in ways that illustrate the simultaneity of being women, yet also outside the normalized ideas of femininity and womanhood. The palimpsests are layers of histories of oppression written onto their flesh, positioning them outside of what is deemed acceptable. As a result, African American women and their dress practices are neither fully liberating nor completely oppressive. Rather, their experiences were complex negotiations of power and how to maintain dignity and define themselves as African-American, as woman, as mother, as labor, as a form of empowerment. In regards to my question about evidence of the formation of a distinctive black womanhood, I would argue that black womanhood is distinctive in so much as African-American women within the multiplicity of their social experiences have a shared history of oppression written onto their flesh that impacts their construction of identity. Thus, black womanhood was both individually and collectively asserted. The evidence of jewelry as a form of adornment, in particular the use of beads, is one line of evidence that may speak to this dynamic. Rather than highlight a particular blue color or jewelry type that appears in higher frequency across the Lady Jordan plantation cabin, I focused instead on the wide variety of both. I, interpret, I interpreted this as the desire for self-expression among African Americans at the Lady Jordan plantation that also falls within traditional African American aesthetics of bold and contrasting color schemes. This African American aesthetic is historically evidence most widely from the quilting tradition and textile trends. I suggest that the diversity in button and beat color allow African Americans to distinguish themselves collectively from the white Americans while simultaneously being able to express and visualize them. And then, returning to my third sub question, I initially asked as African American women move through various spaces at work, at home, and in public spaces during a time of heightened racial oppression, how were their choices regarding just influence? How were their choices of building an adornment situation to the spaces that they occupy? I want to answer this question by first looking at a late 19th century image of Hester Holmes, who, as an enslaved woman, labored at the Levi Jordan plantation in the main house and remained as a house servant after emancipation. She's wearing a, shirt, a short gown, fastened with buttons, with a dark colored petticoat, lightly tied with a ribbon, or fastened with wicked eyes um, around her waist. Her hair is pulled back and covered in a headscarf. Her hands are interlaced as she stares back at us. Her attire sits as a representation of how she maintained the Jordan house clean and modest. This would have been the clothing that Miss Holmes wore as she completed her daily task as a domestic servant, cooking, cleaning, laundering, and making clothing for the Jordan family, to then return to her own cabin to do homekeeping work while perhaps even maintaining her own garden for subsistence needs. I look at Hester Holmes and I wonder how black women's choices and dress were situational shaped. As African American women occupied spaces at home, at work, and in public spaces during the time of heightened racial oppression, their choices regarding dress were impacted by racial and gender violence. The threat of white terrorism against African Americans increased during the post Calvin era. Within the post emancipation era, tactics of social control and surveillance, sanctuary laws similar to those of the colonial era, had a resurgence in the South. Seaton and Conrad outlined how practices of, quote, dressing down became foundational to the survival for African Americans as they moved through the Texas landscape. I interpreted this as a possible situation of dress practice engaged by African Americans at the Levy Jordan plantation by the high percentage of play clothing fashioners we covered at the site. While this can also reflect a restricted um, market accessibility as well as poverty, the prevalence of plain clothing fashioners may also be indicative of the desire to quote dress down as a means of addressing the threat of racial and gender violence. Specific to African American women who worked as domestic servants, dress practices engaged in while laboring in the homes of white employers often reflected modesty and cleanliness. The desire to dress in particular ways while laboring in white spaces was in part a response to the threat of racialized and sexual violence black women faced in the homes of their white employers as black women pushed against controlling images of hypersexual, of hypersexual black femininity of the body through modesty. Importantly, it may also be problematically, it may also problematically be enforced another controlling image, that of a faithful and sexual man. What is important to note is that white homes were dangerous spaces for black women who were forced to meet the expectations of their white employees in terms of their appearance their dress in order to hold on to their jobs and to de-escalate their visibility. The significance of this project lies in its objective to de-homogenize African American histories by engendering the past in order to account for the diversity of African American life ways. Charles Wixer outlined cultural continuity and cultural change, domination and resistance, and views of race, gender, and class 
as three of the four major themes within archaeological studies of African American life and culture. Within a dormant studies of African American life from enslavement through reconstruction, archaeologists often posit cultural continuity, cultural change, or domination and resistance as conformity or resilience to social trends set by white middle class America. However, this project aims to provide a more complex analysis of conformity or resistance by conceptualizing that African American women were neither completely transformed, completely conformed, or absolutely resistant as one of notions of femininity and womanhood. Rather, they often did both, as black women had to negotiate their appearance while considering where and with whom they would be interacting. The application of a black feminist theory, the application of black feminist theory in this research advocates for alternative theoretical approaches within the field of archaeology to address the multiplicity of, of identity formation in the past. Additionally, this project also works to diversify the existing archaeological scholarship of African Americans. Few archaeologists have investigated African American life ways in the southwestern region of the United States during the antebellum and postbellum eras. What archaeological research has been done regarding the post-emancipation experiences in Texas has not focused on that. This work explicitly examines formations of black women at the intersections of race, gender, and class as a means of writing a more inclusive um, history. And I just realized, looking at the time, that I'm cutting it really close, because um, I also realized that it's a at the top as well. Um, so I'm going to try and rush through um, this last bit, just speaking um, directly to my work at the Estate Little Princess and how it builds off of this current book. Um, and if, if any of you have um, seen the talk that Justin Benefite gave um, in the fall of 2018, I believe, and then Bill White has also spoken about the estate of Princess, so I won't go into like the full encompassing um, project, but more focusing on the work that I do there. Um, so since the spring of 2016, I've traveled to St. Croix working in collaboration with the Slave Rights Project. Within this collaboration, I've worked to establish the Estate Little Princess Archaeology Film School. Um, I was co-PI for the 2017 film season, PI for the 2018 film season, and PI for the school season as well. The Estate Little Princess is a joint venture between four of my colleagues, Dr. Alicia Oldenwalder, William White, Justin Donovan, Alexander, Alexander Jones, and um, um, on the wild through geospatial analyses and methodologies explores operations of surveillance during the era of enslavement. White teams on a social cultural approach to the project examining the ethnogenesis of blackness and whiteness in the Danish West Indies. Gunnavon explores the ecology of slavery in the Danish West Indies, implementing archaeobotanical and zoarchaeological methodologies at the site. And Jones takes an applied archaeological approach, um, crafting curriculum that could be used in K 12 classroom settings. And on the board, here I just have a list of all of our. Um, collaborators that made this project possible. Um, as I stated earlier, my current research at the site focuses on the lived experiences of enslaved and later free afro Parisians exploring quotidian practices of self-making from enslavement through post-emancipation. This is an image of two house servants who labored at the estate little princess circa 1890. The man wears a top hat, trousers, and a button frock. The woman has her hair pulled back, covered with a scarf. She wears a short gown, a long petticoat that falls to her ankles, with an, um, that falls to her ankles. The, her hand, their hands are intertwined as they stare back at the camera. The back of the photograph reads, Nana Petty, about 1890. Less than 50 years after the abolition of slavery in the Danish West Indies, I wondered how Nana Petty, her ancestors, and her, and her descendants who labored and lived in the estate of princess constituted their existence through everyday quotidian practices of self-making. Through a black feminist intersectional approach to household archaeology, my research at the Estate Little Princess explores afro perusian identity formations from slavery to reunification. I'm interested in the ways afro perusians at the site historically interact with their natural and social environment as process of self-making within the realm of the Analysis for this project consists of me cataloging and analyzing material culture recovered from the Estate Little Princess to the standards of the digital archaeological archive of comparative slavery. That hosts a digital rate relational database of excavation and artifact information that can be queried online, making archaeological data um, on the African diaspora widely accessible. Using the DAX database guarantees that material culture recovered from the estate is cataloged and analyzed systematically to allow for intra and outra site cross comparative analysis. Through the use of um, SQL, I will analyze clothing and adornment um, artifacts at the estate little princess by querying the assemblages for patterns of archaeological variation to assess frequency, frequencies of the distribution of artifacts as a means of inferring the acquisition and disposal of clothing and adornment goods, potential shifts in um, 
potential and potential shifts in best practices. Material culture data recovery will be analyzed to determine what effect of any operations of power and oppression had on patterns of acquisition, the cost of the goods, market accessibility, and aesthetic valuation, which may provide further inferences regarding the aesthetic choices people at the estate were making regarding dress over time. Additionally, I'll create a database that includes all references to adornment and clothing related material culture, including clothing type, decoration, and data appearance over time from the documentary sources collect collected. The database will be uh, will create a baseline from which to draw comparisons to material culture recovered at the estate level, for instance, and provide contextual data regarding quotidian practices among ethnic provisions across um, time, along with ideologies of race, gender, and class, as well as governmental practices of surveillance and dress. So I'll be looking at um, runaway slave advertisements um, during the Antebellum era, as well as um, postcards, some of which I have up at the front, um, and advertisements as well. Um, through the use of material culture and documentary evidence, my research will set light on hegemonic ideologies of race in your class, as well as the practical reality of the social and economic conditions of slavery, um, of slavery and freedom through which through the lens of social and Of it, 
a lot of the, um, all of the artifacts that I had to go back through for my dissertation research, I actually had to go to the Texas Historical Commission, their actual facility, to sit back through, pull out every bag that had the word button because they had no other information for it. Um, so it just goes to like, you know, the, the sort of work of being really um, clear and articulate when it comes to cataloging practices, which is why I love that so much, because we're trying to make the standardized way for these sites to be in conversation with each other. Because right now, the Levy Joy implementation is one of the largest assemblages um, that focuses on a, on a period of antebellum and postbellum African American life. And the assemblage itself, simply because of how it was cataloged, means that it's, it cannot be in conversation with a lot of other sites.
and a little were they bit. making things for the store, perhaps, or like is there? Yeah, so there's a chance that they were making things for the store. Also, when thinking about large assemblages of like weddings, for instance, could be um, interpreted as like, well, perhaps this was the space of like a lot of or somebody who's a washer or somebody who's a speecher. So there's a way to do that if like, that sort of interpretive work, but. Um, what's actually seen, because Kenneth Brown did a lot of work trying to figure out the occupations of different people mm -hmm. at the housing site, but it focused specifically on um, uh, certain artifacts that were present, um, which could, you know, that could be really tricky because if you would focus on, well, this one particular house site had a large number of buttons, perhaps this was the same as their laundry. Well, there are actually buttons found throughout all of those categories, and although there might be two that have a high frequency, it's not high enough to suggest that this might be something um, astronomical in this particular area in terms of like work, but thinking that this was a communal practice, that people did this work throughout the cabin areas. You mentioned bees, and I wondered where the bees were made from. Did they appear to be on the site, or were they traded? Because bees have to have only just really well been traded. So. Yeah. A lot of the bees that were found at this site um, were glass bees, and there hasn't been any evidence of like slag being found at the site to suggest that the bees were being produced there. Um, there are, have also been small amounts of some of like African trade bees that are found, like small amounts um, of seed bees, which could have, um, if the seed bees themselves, a lot of folks like to attribute them to um, as, as being like an Africanism, so to speak, but the CD itself could have been used in a variety of ways. It could have been used on clothing, it could have been used in your like uh, curtain, like yeah. there's a number of ways that the things themselves could have been. And along those lines, recently in the area, there's been a lot of uh, investigation about quilts. Mm -hmm. uh, the San Jose Museum was leading at this thing. And it seemed like this is one way that this language of culture came out and, and really expressed um, visually some of the design elements that might have come across from Africa. So I wondered if you had a, a way of looking at those. Yeah, I haven't, um, we, we don't find a lot of textiles, unfortunately, at, um, at this particular site or in general, but what, um, what I do have are these really beautiful narratives in the 70 narratives that talk about the ways in which doing quilting practices, be it from like sheets, coverings, or like decorative, but also the way in which they brought that into how they dress themselves. So there, um, there's uh, a quote in the Conrad and Seed book that talks about how, um, it's actually in the style book by White White, that talk about how um, teachers would know, white teachers would know how the black students or the black girls would come to class in all these bright, match matching colors, but it seems, even though outside of their sort of conceptualization, like, is this a style? But all of the black girls had them. Mm -hmm. And it was a quilting, it was a quilting tradition that was brought up, but it was also about what was what was there and available when people needed clothing. Um, it just so happened that, you know, if you have a skill and technique, you can make anything beautiful. Um, so that was definitely a practice that um, is seen in the narratives, but not and in the photographs, but not necessarily and this can come from like the anti cloth tradition of mixing patterns and coloring in a way that the white guys just did not really Thank you. 
and it seems like there could be a really generative thing there that I don't know about. <laughs> um, and and sort of how you envision this work in relationship to other sort of material studies of that kind of pluralistic identity. I think that well, when I think of like our other work, I think of um, Carolyn White does a lot of work on the global study. I also think of the one who does like really great work. And a lot of their work, um, especially thinking about the women's work, also pulls from feminist studies as well, thinking about Judith Butler and how she talks about performance and really bringing in these positionality based um, frameworks into archaeological. Basis. So my framework and use of black feminist thought is really a centering of um, intersectional research, which was um, foundational to the work of Kimberly Crenshaw in 1990. Um, so that, like that particular framework, I use that particular framework as a means of talking about black women because it's based in the historical um, genealogy of black women production. So I want to. Um, I want to state that by saying I think that there are lots of different frameworks that people can be using to answer a variety of questions, um, especially when it comes to material culture analysis. And I think it is a particular act to then use um, sort of vernacular intellectual traditions that are reflected on the people that we're studying. Um, so just saying out loud that that's the, that's the work that I'm also doing uh, when I use black feminist analysis. And I think that the space and avenue that intersectionality, especially thinking about how race, gender, class, and the species of these things come together in really particular ways is something that can apply to everybody because we all are in that interstices as well. So just thinking about the multiple ways in which um, this particular framework doesn't have to be the best.